Okay, today is Thursday, April the 30th, and we are starting on a new president. This is Calvin Coolidge, and um, I have been to Calvin Coolidge's home. He is from Vermont, and a few years ago we took a trip up into the New England area and saw several different president homes, and his was one of our absolute favorites. And I think because um, there was lots of buildings there, his dad basically kind of run, the, there was like a little village because in Vermont, it's very like West Virginia in that there's lots of mountains and trees and everyone was kind of separated and his dad ran the store. So his dad was where everybody kind of came to for everything. So his dad didn't only run the store, he was like the sheriff, he was the justice of the peace, he was the mailman, he was like everything. And so, and Calvin Coolidge grew up very simply. He did chores just like everybody else. Um, he had just kind of a, a simple house. Um, it was, I don't know, it was just kind of neat. We, my, Mr. Barnett and I both liked um, him a lot and liked the, um, the houses that we visited a lot. Um, so we are on number 30. We see that he had 1923 to 1929, which remember he takes over when Harding dies, and then he wins the next term. So he won one term. He did not run again, and um, he just simply said, <laughs> this is a lot like him because his nickname down there is Silent Cow, and he spoke very, very little, and all he said in his announcement was, I choose not to run again. <laughs> no description, no big speech. He just said he chooses not to run again. Um, one funny story about him not speaking very much is supposedly uh, this lady came to dinner at the White House and uh, she went up to him and said, Oh, Mr. President Coolidge, you have to speak to me. I have made a bet that I can get you to say more than two words. And he looks at her and says, you lose. <laughs> I've, I've heard that story several times. It's got to be true, but it is really funny. It also shows he had a really good sense of humor. He had what was called a dry wit, um, which is just can make hardly anybody laugh. And um, in college, even though he was known for not talking very much and kind of being shy in crowds, he was nominated as the most witty and nominated to give this, um, it was an address that they, that was supposed to be kind of funny and sarcastic. And he got nominated to do it because he was so funny, even though he was this very kind of quiet, serious person. Very interesting person. I think he, he needs to go on my list of biographies I want to read next. Vice President was Charles C. Dawes. Remember, that would be for his term that he gets elected for, not the when he first started. This is one of his um, banners when he was run for his campaign. And then I love this quote of his. This was at the house where we visited. It says, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Derelicts is someone who doesn't do anything. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. And that shows a lot about who he is. Just keep going. Just do what you're supposed to do. Um, so I'll, I'll go on to First Lady now and then we'll come back to him in a little bit. Um, so First Lady is... So remember the term FLOTUS, Grace Goodhue Coolidge. Now Grace, I love her too. She's a very interesting person and she was very, very loved as First Lady. And she, her demeanor kind of balanced her very serious husband. She was not like him. She was fun. She was easy to talk to. 
She was easy to get along with. She had a very easy demeanor in public. But she was also, I think, kind of reserved and quiet a little bit like him in that they enjoyed their family time. They were, they, they weren't, uh, they were both frugal, meaning they spent their money wisely. Uh, they weren't lavish at all. And, um, but her personality did balance his a little bit. She also grew up in Vermont. And then she was the first first lady to have a four-year college degree. So she went to college, got her full education, and then worked at the uh, Clark Institute for the Deaf. And she was working with students who were hearing impaired on being able to read lips. And she continued her support for that school and for the deaf for her entire life. While she was first lady, she didn't come out and very vocally support it very much um, but she continued to give money later when they were out of the White House she um, had a position on the board of the school and it was just something that was always very important to her. Helen Keller even came to visit at the White House and there was some famous pictures taken of them that show Helen Keller remember because Helen Keller could not see or hear so she would put her hands on the person's mouth to feel what they were saying. And so there's a wonderful picture of Helen Keller with her hand on um, Grace Coolidge's mouth trying to understand what she's saying. Um, I read this about her once and I love this, that she had a zest for life and simplicity, that she lived in a simple manner, but she had, she enjoyed life. And I... I think that is really cool. I would love someone to say that about me, that she enjoyed life but lived simply at the same time. She liked to sew because it kept her hands busy, so she lots of times had something in her hands that she was um, busy working on. And another just thing of them being industrious people. They just worked no matter who they were or where they were at the time. Um, many times when her husband was working as, even when he worked as governor, they did not live with him because they didn't buy a house in a city where he needed to be. He rented a very cheap room and he visited home and she was basically in charge of raising her sons and she supported him um, in the best way that she could. She had an interest um, in animals and in interesting animals. Um, they even for a time had a pet raccoon at the White House, which I think is a little interesting. And they had two Iredale dogs. Um, and one of them is even in her first lady portrait here. Um, and she liked to be act physically active. She took walks um, every day and enjoyed being, being outside and being very physically active. She also loved sports. She liked keeping up with sports, and she, she was showing how women and people were changing and being modern. She was, she was, um, everyone loved her because she was keeping up with the times. Like, she dressed like they did. She, she, um, she dressed very 20s-like. She was listening to the radio all the time, which was fairly new. She kept up with the sports games on the radio and was always trying to figure out the score of the next game. Uh, old, when she was older and after her husband died, she continued to go. She loved to go to Red Sox baseball games uh, for her whole life as she continued to do that. She was a very popular first lady. And she made a lot of public appearances. She did serve the position of the Girl Scout president, like I told you about on the last one. She um, planted trees. She went to signings. She went to, everyone wanted Grace to be there because she was just this, this fun, energetic, lively person that people could um, relate to. She dressed in the very new modern style, so her dresses were real kind of loose and flowy and a little bit shorter than um, what had been the trend. Um, she was voted one of America's 12 greatest living women in 1931. And I put this on here because it shows her popularity. 
This was even after they were out of the White House. So she wasn't first lady anymore, but everyone just loved her. She was just, they just liked her. Um, her son, when they had two sons, when they went into the White House, and one son who spent a lot of time at the White House was only 16, and he was playing tennis one day at the White House tennis courts with no socks on. And he got a blister. And the blister got infected, and he got blood poisoning, and he died a few days later. Now, don't get worried that you're not wearing your shoes with socks. This is not something that's very common anymore, something that can be fixed easily um, with medicine now, but that something so small would lead to something so major is, well, it's just life, isn't it? It's what history is full of. Small things leading to big things. So we should take care in our lives, right? To realize that things that start out small. That's the lesson of the baobabs, right? Clean out your baobabs. Because small things do grow to big things. And so he died, and this was right as Coolidge was um, campaigning to be president. So after he fulfilled the term for Harding and they were getting into another election. And so she didn't participate a lot in his campaign. And a lot of people say it was because of uh, her son dying. Um, and this really hurt Coolidge too. He was, he was just really hit very hard by this. And he said all joy of the presidency has gone away since this happened. Um, she continued to be very strong. She showed a very strong front to the public because she knew, and she even wrote after she was gone out of the White House about how the job consumes you. You are the job. You have to be first lady. No matter what you feel like, no matter what's going on in your personal life, that is who you are. And even Coolidge wrote about how no one knew how much of herself she put aside so that she could be the person that needed to be first lady. And that is, that's true responsibility. Um, I think that's, and she's the first one to really write about that kind of idea of not being who you really are, but being what the people need you to be. She was a strong supporter of the Red Cross and, um, and, regularly visited the veterans, just like we talked about Florence Harding doing. She went to the hospital also and visited the veterans regularly and gave to and supported the Red Cross and worked uh, with the Red Cross. Okay, Calvin Coolidge. I already told you a little bit about him, um, but here is a few pictures from our trip. Uh, this is the house he mostly grew up in, the house he was born in, was just a little room on the back of the storefront. So they had, they ran the store in the front and they just lived in the back, which is tiny, very humble. And um, he was born there and then eventually they, they lived in this house here. Um, he was born in Plymouth, Vermont. Like I said before, his father was the storekeeper, but he also, in, in those small town remote places, they ran everything. Uh, he wasn't just a storekeeper. He was one of the most important people in town. Um, his mother died when he was 12. And um, he, it was known of him that he carried a picture of her in his wallet for the rest of his life. And would often uh, be caught daydreaming about her. Um, he, the light of his life left when she died. Uh, he grew up with a simple schoolhouse education. His young education was just in a schoolhouse that's mm, right down the road from this little house. Everything was right there in that little village. And he walked to the schoolhouse after doing his daily chores and, or, and before doing his daily chores. And uh, that's where his education started. He became a lawyer. They always lived very frugally. They did not spend a lot of money. The one indulgence that he kind of gave Grace was he wanted her to dress nicely. So they did spend some money on clothes, but they didn't spend a lot of, they didn't own their first house till after they left the White House. Um, 
they rented small, small places. Um, he served as mayor of a small town, then a state senator, then governor of Massachusetts, then vice president, and then president. When um, Harding died, someone had to go out to um, the this house because he did not have a, I don't think his father had a phone. And so someone came all the way there and then gave him the message. And then his dad, who was also a justice of the peace, who could do weddings and um, was kind of like a judge, he actually gave his son the presidential oath of office sitting in their home in Vermont. And I believe it's in this room by the light of that gas lamp that they t that he took the oath of office that night. Um, he was known, like I said earlier, to be very quiet and hard to talk to. The word is taciturn, um, kind of quiet and serious. He was, but one thing I read about him recently though is he, it made him nervous to be around strangers. He was nervous and unsure of himself. When he was a young boy and he heard people out in the front room of the house that he didn't know, it took everything in him to go through that room. He didn't want to go in. So that's kind of interesting that someone like that could become one of the most important people in our country that we look to. He was supposed to be real stern and serious, but here's the kind of interesting part. Like I said before, he was funny. He liked to play practical jokes. He would One of his um, practical jokes that he played on the staff was to ring the bell to let everybody know that he was about to walk to the residence, but then he would go out and go on a walk. <laughs> so he wouldn't actually do what he said. Um, and he was so serious and always kind of straight-faced, but yet the newspapers took all these funny pictures of him in outfits. There's an outfit of him, uh, there's a picture of him in like an Indian, big Indian headdress. There's a picture of him in an Indian, in a cowboy outfit with chaps. Um, he had, he liked to ride horses, but then eventually, instead of riding a, a real horse, he had a mechanical horse, and I believe he still had it at the White House, and he did that for exercise, was riding his mechanical horse. Um, this picture I wanted to put on here, because I thought this was one of the coolest things I've seen at a presidential museum. It was the story of his life through letters. And so it starts here when he first goes away to school, and he's a boy of, like a young teenager, writing home. And then as you go on, he's got like the... He's the mayor, and then he's the governor. And so his return address on these changes until eventually you've got a, an envelope that has the White House as the return address. And it just tells the story of where he has been and um, his whole life through letters that he mailed home. Just neat, which shows that every part of you speaks to your life. And, and that's something that's a little sad that that's gone away a little bit. We're not going to have that. We're, what are we going to look back and have our life in text messages? I would hate, I don't want that. I'd rather have letters where you're sitting down thinking about it, sending a thought to, to your parents or to, to your friends. But it's very interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more about him as we get into the events too and as things pop up in my head. But I sent you some links to um, look up some information about him so that you could um, do, a, do a little bit of uh, do a little bit of research on your own if you'd like. okay um, in, the, um, in the comments below, um, I want you to just pick one thing through this whole um, PowerPoint, either about the first lady or about him that you thought was interesting or you'd like to know a little bit more about. Okay? One thing throughout the whole thing, what's something you were interested in, thought was cool, like to know a little bit more about, a question that came to mind. These these pop up in your mind all the time when we're at school. So what's something that came to mind as we were going through just this one today? <laughs>